the other topic that we need to talk about as part of chapter seven on, on profit and loss is speculation. Okay. Now there's a very broad notion of speculation that people frequently use, and something like speculation is trading in hopes of profiting from changes in a market price. So the, the idea is that since we don't know what the price of the good will be going forward, what we hope is that we can trade in some way today so that we can make a profit when the price of the good changes into the future. And, and that's not a wrong definition of speculation, but one of the things about that is that, that in that sense, all entrepreneurs and all really consumers even in some sense are speculators, right? Even when we decide to buy gas today because we think the price of gas might go up tomorrow, even though our tank's not all the way empty yet. I mean, in that sense, we are speculating and, 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 and sort of we're, we're betting against, uh, hoping to, to, to sort of do better by thinking carefully about changes in market prices in the future. But when we think about sort of speculation in a more professional, more systematic way, we really need to think about, about other kinds of things. And, and so um, one of the examples that we can talk about is what's called short selling. Okay. And short selling basically means that, that, that uh, two parties create a contract where one promises to deliver to the other some good or, or financial instrument in the future that the, that, that person doesn't own currently. So for example, a contract where I promised you that I would deliver to you in six months, say 10,000 shares of some firm stock or 100,000 barrels of oil or whatever it might be. I don't own that yet but I am promising you in this contract that in six months I will have that and I will give it to you in six months. And so the interesting question is how much do I want to get paid for that contract and how much is a person willing to pay pay for that, that contract? And, and if you, you, know, you might be thinking, why would somebody do that? Well, what you're hoping is, right, if you say, I don't have this uh, stock now, but I'll have it in six months from now, what you're hoping is is that it will be cheaper in six months, right? When when you actually have to buy it and deliver it to someone, and on the other half of that bargain, right, you're hoping it will be more expensive in six months when you get it. That way, you'll you'll have paid for delivery today, but when you actually get it in six months, it will be worth more than what you what you paid today. So let's let's take a specific example and see if we can see how this works. So suppose that, that uh, 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 we do decide to create a contract, right? And, uh, and, and someone comes to me and says, I will deliver to you 10,000 shares of some stock in six months from now. Uh, I am asking $150,000 for this contract now, which is $15 a share, right? $15 a share times, times 10,000 shares. So I might be willing to pay $150,000 for this contract that gets me those shares of stock. Uh, in the future, if I think, right, the price is going to go up. On the other hand, my, my, my friend who is willing to sell me that contract is betting and speculating that the price will, will go down. So let's see what happens, right? Let, let's sort of think about what the two possible outcomes are here. What does each party hope will happen? And I've got my, my trusty whiteboard here. Hopefully we can put this onto the screen, right? So if we contract for 10,000 shares to be delivered in six months, right? and I pay 15 a share or $150,000 today, what, what, is, what does the other person hope will happen, right? Well, there's, what he hopes will happen is the price falls. Say the price falls to $10 a share in six, month, in six months, right? In six months, when he has to deliver me that 10,000 shares of stock, he's only going to pay 100000 for it, right? $10 a share times 10000 He hands over the stock to me. Uh, he's out 100000 that he paid for it. But remember, I paid him 150000 six months earlier, right, to get the contract, so he profits 50000 Me, on the other hand, I lose that 50000 I paid $150,000 six months ago and then got stock worth 100000 today. So, so what, the, what the seller of this kind of contract, what the short seller hopes happens, is price falls. He's speculating that he can profit from a decline in price. Why would I take this deal? Well, what I'm hoping is the price will go up. Suppose the price goes up to $20 a share in, six months later when he has to actually get me, get me the stock. Now he's got to pay $200,000 to deliver that stock to me. Right? Notice, by the way, he earned $150,000 from me six months earlier. Now he's got to pay two hundred, dollars So he's out $50,000. That's his loss. I gain that, right? Because I now get this stock that he hands over to me, which is worth $200,000. I could sell it for $200,000 and profit that $50,000 difference between what I paid six months earlier and what it's worth today. 
right? So that's the basic idea here, that what you have in these short selling contracts or these speculative contracts is two people who have differing views of what the future holds. One of them is going to be right, one of them is going to be wrong, right? And, and, and that uh, what this does is, is it's a way of encouraging people to, to become more knowledgeable about, about trends, about the future, and to, to become better guessers about what will happen to the price. Because if you're wrong, right, you lose. If you're right, you can profit from it. A couple of things to think about with these sorts of, with these sorts of contracts, right? Um, one thing to note, right, is that, that, again, only one person can be right. And sometimes people get mad and, and, at, at people who profit from, say, say uh, short selling, right? That our short sell here uh, profited by prices falling and people say, that's wrong, you shouldn't be able to profit from that. But remember, for every person, who, who, for every person who's betting that prices will fall, speculating that prices will fall. There has to be another person on the other side of that contract who's speculating prices will rise. Why don't we get upset with the person who gains right, from, from, from prices going up? Right? So, so both parties, voluntary contract, both parties are, are testing their expectations this way. Right? And again, this, these sorts of contracts, markets like this, provide an incentive for people to correctly predict future movements in price and undertake actions to minimize their negative effects. You can think about my decision to be willing to take a contract like this, particularly if you think not so much in terms of shares of stock, but think in terms of barrels of oil. For example, why would, uh, say, the airlines uh, be willing to agree to a contract like this where they pay, say, $150,000 today for 10,000 barrels of oil at $15, $15 a barrel right, uh, for, delivery, for delivery in six months? Why would they accept something like that? Well, for them, it's a form of insurance, right? Uh, it, one thing you can do is you can lock yourself into a price today if you think the price is going to rise. So if I'm the, the airlines and I think oil prices are going to go up and someone comes to me and says, I'll deliver you this much oil in six months if you pay some price for it today. I think that price is lower today, the price he's offering today, than what the price will be in the future. I'm going to take that because I can basically buy oil at a cheap price today for delivery in the future, if I'm right, right, and the price goes up. So one thing to think about here is people who, who, who uh, are willing to buy short selling contracts like this do so as a kind of form of insurance. They, they are insuring themselves against the price increase. On the other hand, you can think of the seller as sort of selling insurance, or think about it that way. Um, the seller is thinks price is going to go the other way and is willing and is willing to take willing to take that risk, right? He's willing to insure me because he thinks the odds are sufficiently good that that the price will go will go the other way. So again, this is this is the way that these speculation contracts work. So why is this desirable? I mean sort of why is this good? I think perhaps the way to best way to see this is to think about what happens uh, when people believe there's going to be some kind of say natural disaster or social event social you know, occasion event that will re reduce the supply of a good in the future. Again, let's let's just stay with oil because it's an obvious example. So suppose you think there's a hurricane coming, right, and it's going to destroy some oil production facilities. Uh, you're an oil company. What do you do today? Well, you expect today, you're expecting in the future that the price of oil will be greater as a result of the hurricane. So you're going to speculate and try to profit from that. How are you going to do that? By holding off on selling some of the good today. Think back to our stuff about what can move the supply and demand curve and expected price and all that. If you think the price is going to go up in the future, you're going to hold off some supply today because you're going to want to sell that later on when the price when the price is higher. Okay? So you might people might say, well, that's you know, that's not fair. You're profiting from the from the disaster and so on. But think about it for a moment, right? One of the things that this does is it makes more oil available in the future than would have been the case otherwise. If I speculate by saying I'm not going to sell some of that oil today, I'm going to hold it off to the future when I think production facilities will be crippled by the by this hurricane, I'm actually doing something that's socially very desirable, right? I'm moving resources from a time today when they are rel relatively less scarce to a time in the future when they will be relatively more scarce. Right? So, one, so one way to think about what that speculation is doing, again, if you're right, I mean, if the hurricane actually happens and things get destroyed, is that you're making resources available, more resources available later on, right, when, when they're going to be needed and, 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 and taking them away now when they're, when, they're less, when they're less scarce, they're less important. And that's socially desirable. And think about what that does to the price of the good as well, right? It's true that that will make oil somewhat more expensive today, but it will also make it cheaper in the future than it would have been 
had I not engaged in the speculation, right? The fact that I held some of it off and waited for the price to rise means that that supply curve will be farther out than it would have been otherwise, right? And that means that prices in the future will be lower than they would have been had we not had the speculation. So one thing to notice here is that one of the things speculators do is to even out, is to reduce price fluctuations. With no speculation, right, the price would be very low today and then very high after the hurricane. But if we allow people to speculate, it means a slightly higher price today, because we're holding some of that supply off, and a slightly lower price than would have been the case otherwise later on, because we'll bring it back uh, when after the hurricane hits. And so rather than seeing this gigantic you know, difference between prices as a result of the hurricane, it's much narrower. And that reduction in price fluctuations is, is socially desirable. That makes it easier, uh, for, it reduces risk to people using those resources, right? It makes it easier for them to, to plan for the future. Of course, you could be wrong, right? Our speculators might be wrong, and if they're wrong, they pay the price, okay? Um, but again, the possibility of profit, prices and profits, provide the incentive and provide the knowledge necessary to get the future as right as we can. If we don't create opportunities for people to, to sort of uh, put, their, put their money where their mouth is and to, and to uh, make these predictions about the future, if we say you can't speculate at all, we end up in this world where we have these huge price variances all the time. One last way to think about this, speculators integrate markets through time just as middlemen and entrepreneurs integrate them through space. Right? The entrepreneur who profits from moving goods from, from New Jersey to Maine or Maine to New Jersey, right? the entrepreneur who profits from, from doing that is just our speculators just like that. Right? Our speculators just like that in the sense that our speculator integrates markets through time. So speculation right, is, is an important part of markets. It's socially uh, desirable. It leads, to, it leads to good ends. And, and, and all of us, again, are speculators in the sense that we're always uh, making our choices in the face of uncertainty and, and, and placing our bets about what we think will happen down the road. But formal markets and speculation are, are an important part about how uh, the profit and loss system works and about how market capitalism does its job.